So in parts one and two of the lesson, we discussed that the semi-conservative model of replication is the model that was shown to be correct. That was the experiment by Meselson and Stahl that helped provide support for that semi-conservative model. You should also recall that nucleotides have a sugar and phosphate backbone and the nitrogenous bases that are attaching to each other by hydrogen bonds in the center of each double helix. And finally, those nucleotides are attached together by a special type of bond called a phosphodiester linkage or bond. Um, and that's between the three prime end of the sugar and the phosphate group of a new nucleotide. So the simplest look at replication is this. An existing segment of DNA is separated and all the nucleotides are paired with a complementary base. So A and T paired with each other and C and G paired with each other. But of course, there's more to it than that. When the strands are separated, they are anti-parallel, meaning that there's a 5' prime end at the top of one strand and a 3' prime end at the top of the other. So the nucleotides need to be added in opposite directions, always in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, where the 3' prime end is the one that's getting longer. There's also machinery doing replication. It's a pretty cool process, but the nucleotides don't just poof into the correct order. There are enzymes putting them there. The whole complex of enzymes that does the job has to start somewhere, and it starts at specific DNA sequences called origins of replication. And prokaryotes just have one in their circular chromosome, and, but eukaryotes have many, and they're along every chromosome. So eukaryotic replication is something like this. There's a template molecule that splits and begins to be replicated at many origins of replication, forming bubbles. Replication moves outward, which expands the bubbles. Replication moves outward even more until the bubbles merge, forming two distinct DNA molecules. Each new molecule is formed of one template strand and one daughter strand. If we zoom in, we can recap a little bit more vocabulary. You have the origin of replication, marked here as a black dot, but is actually a specific nucleotide sequence. You have the replication bubble, named a bubble because that's what it looks like when you start to grow an extra set of DNA inside an existing double helix, and so through a microscope, that would actually look somewhat like a bubble. And the replication fork, also named because it looks like a fork. And each end of the bubble has a replication fork where the strands are being separated as the daughter strands begin to grow into that fork. And there's even more vocabulary, some more terms to know here when we're discussing DNA replication. This anti-parallel DNA 5' prime to 3' prime direction thing that we've been talking about and we'll talk more about always leads to newly synthesized DNA on each of the two template strands behaving a little differently from each other. And so the result is called the leading strands and the lagging strands. The leading strand is being copied into the replication fork. And that's in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The lagging strands, and so that's plural, strands, because there'll be lots of them, and they're made in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. You always synthesize DNA in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, because the DNA nucleotides can only be added to the growing strand on the 3' prime end. And those are being made in tiny fragments. So again, we're calling this continuous strand the leading strand, and we're calling the discontinuous fragments the lagging strands. Lagging, I guess, because they're kind of lagging behind, because they have to keep restarting this process of making a new DNA fragment over and over and over and over. And guess what? They have one more name. So they could be called lagging strands. They could also be referred to as Okazaki fragments, named for the Japanese biochemist that discovered them. Now, the lagging strands have a problem. They can only connect 
new nucleotides to the three prime end of the existing strand or sequence that's being created. How do they connect to fragments on the other side? The answer to that question is DNA ligase. DNA ligase moves in and it's the enzyme responsible for helping complete that final bond so that all the strands are connected. What I just showed you is also happening in both directions. You've got leading and lagging strands being synthesized in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Now we're going to add just another little layer of complexity here. The enzyme that adds new DNA nucleotides cannot actually start a strand. So every leading and lagging strand starts with what I've colored pink here, and that's an RNA primer. And that RNA primer is put in place by a special enzyme aptly called primase. It's going to do this for every lagging strand also. Primer goes in first, and then the DNA is synthesized. The enzyme adding nucleotides to the growing DNA strand is called DNA polymerase 3. Now, this is an E. coli where these molecules were first worked out and discovered. So there would be a whole bunch of them working on all the strands closest to the forks. These newly separated template strands of DNA are going to open up new areas for the DNA polymerase to move in after primase has left that primer in place. The DNA polymerase in E. coli, yet again, responsible for removing and replacing the RNA primer is DNA polymerase 1. And so it would move in and one nucleotide at a time, it would kick out that RNA primer and add new DNA nucleotides. So to bring it all together, because all of these enzymes are operating at the same time, it's going to look something like this, keeping in mind that this is two-dimensional and not very detailed, and what we're really looking at here is some very complex molecular machinery with enzymes that kind of look like little hands grabbing, you know, as a knitter, I would think of this as yarn running through those hands, and all I can kind of show you is like a hazy blob, but an enzyme called helicase is responsible for separating or unwinding the template DNA strands, breaking the hydrogen bonds. There are single strand binding proteins that are stabilizing the molecule, and upstream, so you have to kind of picture what would be to the left of this drawing, topoisomerase is re relieving the stress and strain all of this unwinding puts on the double helix. So there is that enzyme as well, it's just out of the picture. DNA polymerase 3 is growing or adding nucleotides to make the DNA strand grow in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Primase is laying down new primers for the lagging strand. DNA polymerase 1 is removing RNA nucleotides and replacing those RNA primers with DNA nucleotides. And DNA ligase is sealing the Okazaki fragments, or those lagging strand fragments, by forming the one remaining phosphodiester bond that's needed. The leading strand keeps growing into the fork. It is continuous. And the lagging strands are added in short segments heading away from the fork. It's really, this is a marvel of a machine, and the more we're learning about it, the more amazing it seems to me. Um, in E. coli, because that's what we've been talking about, are the E. coli proteins, the whole DNA molecule, that circular chromosome that's millions of base pairs long, that can be done in 20 to 40 minutes with one origin of replication. Eukaryotic chromosomes are a bit slower, they have lots of origins of replication, so they have lots of these enzyme complexes working at the chromosome at the same time. They have a lot more proofreading enzymes, um, but 
still, it's accomplished in an amazing amount of time considering that we have billions of nucleotides and while some nucleotides are not copied correctly and not paired up correctly, it's very rare. So, I, it's, I'm amazed. Life is amazing.